relatively the same time period uh, as Amos. Uh, we have Jeroboam II is one of the uh, key figures. Um, but whereas Amos was talking primarily about social justice and about how they were growing wealthier and wealthier uh, and that they were not looking out for the poor and the widowed and the orphans, Hosea is going to take a different tack. He is going to talk more about really their, their religious infidelity would be the way to put it. And so uh, this is an interesting book because remember I said prophets did unusual things to make unusual object lessons. Um, this one might be the high point of the unusual. So I'm going to play us our Bible project short little video to give us a summary and then we'll kind of begin picking things apart. prophet Hosea. Now, Hosea lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, which he sometimes calls Ephraim or Jacob, about 200 years after they had broken off from southern Judah. Remember the story from 1 Kings. Hosea was called to speak on God's behalf during the reign of one of Israel's worst kings, Jeroboam II. The nation was descending into chaos, and in the year 722, the big bad Assyrian empire swooped in and decimated Israel. Again, see the story in 2 Kings. And Hosea had seen all of this coming. The book is a collection of some 25 years of his preaching and writing. It's almost all poetry. And this whole collection has been designed to have three main sections. Let's just dive in. You'll see how it works. The opening part tells the story of Hosea's broken marriage to a woman named Gomer, who commits adultery. Now, it's not totally clear whether Gomer slept around with other men before or only after they got married. But they did have three children together, and things fell apart. The important point is that God tells Hosea that despite Gomer's unfaithfulness, he is to go find her, to pay off her debts to her lovers, and to commit his love and faithfulness to her once again. And then God says that all of this, the broken and repaired marriage, the children, it's all a prophetic symbol telling the story of God's relationship to Israel. So God has been like a faithful husband to Israel. He rescued them out of slavery. He brought them to Mount Sinai, where he entered into a covenant with them. He asked them to be faithful to him alone. But then he brought Israel into the promised land, and they took all the abundance that he gave them, and they dedicated it to the worship of the Canaanite god, Baal. And so God has a legitimate reason. He could end the covenant and divorce Israel, and he thinks about doing so, but instead, he says that he's going to pursue Israel again and renew his covenant with them. And he says why? It's purely because of his own love, compassion, and faithfulness. Hosea then spells out what all this means. He says the consequences for Israel's rebellion will be imminent defeat by other nations and exile. But there's hope for future restoration. One day Israel will once again repent and come back to worship their God. And Hosea says, he will place over them a new messianic king from the line of David who will bring God's blessing. And so this opening section introduces all the main ideas of the book. Israel has rebelled, and God's going to bring severe consequences, but God's own covenant love and mercy are more powerful than Israel's sin. And so in the remaining sections of the book, Hosea's poetry explores these themes in more depth. So there are two collections of his accusations and warnings for Israel, and then each of these is concluded by a very hopeful poem about God's mercy and hope for the future. So chapters 4 through 10, Hosea explores the causes and effects of Israel's unfaithfulness. He said numerous times that Israel lacks all knowledge or understanding of God. The Hebrew word to know, which is yada, it's more than just intellectual activity. It describes personal relational knowledge. It's the difference between just knowing about someone and then actually knowing that someone. And God wants Israel to know him like that in a relationship. He wants them to experience his love for them and become the kind of knowledge that transforms their hearts and lives so that they love him in return. And so this is why Hosea is constantly exposing the hypocrisy of Israel's worship. He constantly shows how they're breaking the Ten Commandments, how they're allowing grave injustice in their communities, and then they go to their sacred temples and they offer sacrifices to God like everything is just fine. But it's not fine. 
And not only because of their hypocrisy, but because they're worshipping all of these other gods too. He, he mentions many times their altars to Baal at the cities of Bethel and Gilgal. And not only have they given their allegiance to other gods, but they repeatedly accuses Israel for trusting in their political alliances with Egypt and Assyria. So instead of trusting God to protect them, they want to become like these nations and rely solely on military power. And God says it's all going to come crashing down on their heads. Because in not too long, Assyria will turn on them and come to ravage their lands. In this other section of warning, Hosea gives an ancient Israelite history lesson to show how this family's been unfaithful from the beginning. So he alludes to the patriarch Jacob's lying and treachery. Remember Genesis 27 and 28. He alludes to Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. Remember the book of Numbers. He alludes to their appointment of the corrupt king Saul who led the people into sin and disaster. Remember the stories in 1 Samuel. This is all Hosea's way of saying some things in this family never change. So what hope does Hosea have? Well, we know from chapter 3 that God's going to do something to save and restore his people. And that's what these two concluding chapters explore. Chapter 11 is beautiful. The poem depicts God as a loving father who raised his son Israel and then shared everything with him. But the son grew up and rebelled and turned on the father, taking advantage of his generosity. And so in this poem, God is emotionally torn apart. One moment he's angry, and naturally he says he's going to bring severe consequences. But the next moment he's heartbroken. And then he says that he's moved by his mercy and compassion, and he's going to forgive the son that he loves. He says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? My heart churns inside of me. All my compassion is aroused. And so while God did allow Israel to be conquered by Assyria, face the consequences, that's not God's final word. There's still hope. And that's what the last chapter is about. Hosea calls Israel to repent and turn back to their God, but he knows that it won't last because it never has before. And God says that one day he will heal their waywardness and love them freely. God goes on to describe this new healed Israel as a lush tree that will grow deep roots and broad branches and offer shade and fruit to all of the nations. It's an image of God's promise to Abraham, how Israel was to become a blessing to the nations. And God's saying, if that's ever going to happen, it's going to require an act of God's grace and healing power to repair the deep brokenness and sinful selfishness of the human heart, so that God's people can receive his love and love him in return. This is what God promises to do. Now, after this poem concludes, we find the very last words of the book. They're like an appended note. They're likely from the author who collected Hosea's poetry and now wants to speak to you, the reader, for a second. And he says, who is wise and discerning to understand all of this? In other words, Hosea's poem. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So the author wants you to know that Hosea's ancient poetry to northern Israel is not locked in the past. It reveals deep truths about God's character and purposes and human nature. And while God should and does bring his justice on human evil, his ultimate purpose, his heart, is to heal and to save his people. And that's what the book of Hosea is all about. The book of the prophet Hosea. And Hosea lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, which... for the book to make full sense. Um, one, which he brought up, is this idea of the overall theme metaphor of covenant with God, which is going to be represented as marriage covenant. Okay? Where... Yahweh equals the husband and Israel equals
equals the like. But for this metaphor to work for you, um, you can't think too modernly, and you have to get as far and deep into ancient patriarchy uh, <laughs> for this to all function as we would think about marriage and things like that. So like, some people become very offended when they think about how this book speaks about God to his people uh, by, by looking at a very um, uh, patriarchal view. Like this isn't two equal partners coming to a marriage. Uh, this is this fits under a view of what's called a a suzerain vassal treaty, and a suzerain vassal treaty in the ancient world was one in which you had a greater who comes and makes a covenant with a lesser and says, as long as you do these things, I'm your protector, your helper. And we talk about that with Israel. Uh, with God in Israel at Mount Sinai. That's like a suzerain vassal treaty. I'll be your God. I'll protect you. Here are the stipulations of what you must do. Okay? That's the way, also, you're going to see in some ways the way this interaction works between husband and wife. Um, but we'll look at that some. But so keep that in the back of your mind. Um, second, the, the major theme is about Israel being wayward and going after other deities. And the main deity that is a threat uh, is the Canaanite god. And there's word plays on this. I'm going to just go into it a little bit. Uh, the Canaanite god um, whose title was Baal. His actual name, which we don't hardly ever hear, is Hadad. Baal Hadad. Which means Lord or Master Hadad. But in the Bible, he's almost always just referred to Baal. Okay, that's how we know that name. Um, we also will get a little bit about Asherah. Um, this is a, a female fertility goddess. Okay, but here's why these two are important in Canaanite religion and in the area that becomes Israel and Judah. These are major uh, fertility and a uh, fertility goddess and a storm god, which are really important in an agricultural agrarian life. So almost everybody's gonna be farming. And think about it as like farming in Southern California, where most of the time it never ever rains, and you don't have sprinkler systems. And all farming would be really dependent upon key rains coming in the rainy season. Thus, the worship of Baal Hadad, so that in the fall, winter, rain would come, you'd fill cisterns, you could water plants, all those kinds of things would work. So as Israel comes into the land, as worshipers of this deity, who on the surface, in the, like the, the, the most basic understanding in the earliest periods of these nomadic, wandering Hebrews, Yahweh is a warrior god. He's really helpful for fights. He's helpful when we go into battle, right? It's always we win the war because he's on our side. But in an ancient world where different deities had different functions, as you start to farm and you need rain and you need fertility, it's like... Okay, well, we got this guy for that, but we need them for, the, for agriculture, for growth, for our animals being fertile, for the ground being fertile, for produce to come. So in these prophetic books where, where Canaanite worship's being not, we're often going to get all of this kind of like bounty of the land produce that Yahweh's saying is from him. Because he's trying to say, they don't do this. I might do war, but I do everything. So that's going to be in the backdrop of what's going on here, okay? And this idea of Baal, the name of the deity, or it's his, his, the way, his moniker, can mean master, lord, but it is also a common word for husband. And like you're again talking about the patriarchy part. It can also, even in modern Hebrew, be, mean owner. 
right? If you own something, you are the Baal of that thing. You're the, the owner of it, the master of it, the lord of it, okay? But this, was a, this is a term uh, in Hebrew that can mean husband. So there's going to be a word play later that will make sense when we get back. All right, any questions about any of that? That's kind of the setup. Well, I want us to look at the first three chapters, which kind of give the story outline. Uh, then it's just like brutal judgments about their, their bad behavior. And we'll hit some high points that show restoration is possible. All right, any questions? All right, let's look at chapter one of Hosea. And again, this is where living out an object lesson gets a little bit risky. Um, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Biri, in the days of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah, in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take for yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Except for the book of Hosea, I've never heard whoredom, but um, it's like one of those old King James things that sticks around in translations. Nobody talks like this, but um, it's probably too scandalous to translate it in other ways. Um, there's been argument about whether or not his wife Gomer was just an unfaithful spouse, or some have suggested that she was actually a cultic prostitute. I mean, we've talked about there's this kind of religious phenomenon where you have, as part of religion, um, use of prostitution. There's been arguments, different people have argued one versus the other, but we don't have to solve that. The point is valid either way. Uh, she is not faithful to the covenant of marriage. So he went and he took Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And now the kids get in on the action because the kids' names are all going to be prophetic statements as well. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel. For in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. All right, the Jezreel Valley, for people who have gone to Israel, or people who will go, uh, the Jezreel Valley is basically the breadbasket of Israel. Uh, it runs between Nazareth, is up on the hills, and then you have Mount Carmel, and you have Megiddo right in the middle of it. So those plains around Megiddo, which is where throughout the history of, of ancient Israel, huge battles happen because it's the major thoroughfare. And it's the area where so much agriculture happens. And it's so prolific in that way that when the Bible tells the story of the final battle, it talks about Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo, which sits right in the heart of Jezreel Valley. So this is always seen as a place of big battles. But when Ahab and Jezebel were defeated and the Amri dynasty ended and this Jehu's dynasty begins, it happens in Jezreel Valley. So he's predicting this dynasty is going to fall as well, and people will all know that valley represents a cataclysmic battle, so name the kid Jezreel. So every time that kid's name gets called, it's like a reminder from the prophet about, get ready, it's going to go down in Jezreel. Awkward, but the next one gets worse. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, Name her Lo Uhama, which means no mercy or no pity. For I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel or forgive them. But I will have pity on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. So name your next kid No Mercy or No Pity. So again, every time she gets called and roll or somebody's yelling for her name to come home, people hear the yelling, no mercy, no pity, which is like there will be no pity on us, okay? Gets worse. When she had weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said, name him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. 
all right? So you have a prophet who's married to a prostitute, or at least a woman who everyone knows is cheating on him, saying, this is what's going on between you and God. And then every time their kids get called, it's reminding them Jezreel Valley of a great battle coming of you're not pitied by God anymore and you're not his people. All right. That's the Christmas card you wanted to get, right? <laughs> What's new in the house? What happened this year in Hosea's house? Oh, that's a great Christmas letter. All right. Um, yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. Okay, so it's starting already. It's going to give you this glimpse, though, but it's not all is lost. Here's a glimpse of restoration already. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall take possession of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So you get this glimpse already. You've seen all these things, and this is the object lesson. But one day, Jezreel will be great again, and these people who are called not my people will be called people of the living God. Okay? Picture of judgment, picture of restoration. But then he unloads. Say to your brother, Ami, and to your sister, Ruhamah, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face, and her adultery from between her breasts. I will strip her naked and expose her as the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and turn her into parched land and kill her with thirst. Again, be thinking, the metaphor is this is a picture of a land made desolate in exile by a foreign warrior. But what makes it really like icky feeling is that we're talking about a husband and wife and we're talking about God and land and infiltrators, but it has this like abusive feeling, which has caused all kinds of scholars issues of, of making sense out of this book. <laughs> Upon her children also I will have no pity, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore, she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers. They give me bread and my water, my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Again, all the agricultural stuff. That's why she's going after these gods, saying, hey, I need harvest, I need productive sheep, and I need all this kind of stuff. That's where I get it. Therefore, I will hedge her up, uh, hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better with me then than now. She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished upon her silver and gold that they used for Baal. Therefore I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her shame in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. I will put an end to all her mirth, her festivals, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed festivals. I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my pay, which my lover, uh, lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and wild animals shall devour them. I will punish her for her festival days of the Baals, when she offered incense to them, and decked herself with her <coughs> ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers, and forgot me, says the Lord. Therefore, I will now allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. From there, I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of a hole a door of hope. There, she shall respond as in the days of her youth, at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. Now, here comes the wordplay. On that day, says the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. There's another way to say husband. And it's the word ish, which means man, but it can also mean husband. Another way to say husband is Baal. It says in that day, right, when all things get made right, you will call me this, 
and you won't call me your husband, i.e. the word Baal, and says, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth and they shall be mentioned uh, by name no more. So it's like, you even for, in that day, when all things are made right and we're reunited, you even forget that word, even in the good sense of how to use it, right? Because it's like, I want to just wipe it from your memory so you don't slip back into this relationship. I will make for you a covenant on that day with the wild animals, with the birds of the air, with the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, the war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will take you for my wife forever. I will take you for my wife in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and in mercy. I will take you for my wife in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. On that day, I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow him for myself in the land. And I will have pity on lo uhama. I will have pity on no pity. And I will say to not my people, lo ami, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Oh my. So when that time in restoration happens, and again, back to this image we always use, right? The broken bond saying, God and humans, this restored marriage will happen. He says, you'll rest in security. There's going to be no more warring and fighting. And between humans and nature, all the bounty of the land and all will be like for your good. So the humans to God, humans to humans, and human to nature, this picture is at that day will all be made right. So even though your names of your children will remind them of the judgment coming, in the end, again, this is a theme that goes throughout scripture, right? In the end, we get a new name. This picture in heaven, like we're given a new name, and it's like at the end of time, when things are restored, not pitied will be called pitied, not my people will be called my people, and they will say to me, you are our God. All right, which is like this powerful picture of restoration. But then we get one, not one more, I mean, it's going to go on and on and on. But then we get another narrative, which some people say, is this happening again? Or is it being rehearsed again? But it says, the Lord said to me again, go, love a woman who has a lover and is adulterous. Just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turn to their other gods and love raisin cakes, this raisin cakes is thought to be a cultic meal, right? So it's like we have certain things we know we eat for Easter and we eat at Christmas time. The raisin cakes are thought to be something that went with Canaanite worship. Again, it's like a fertility kind of a thing. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer of barley and a measure of wine. And I said to her, you must remain as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore and you shall not have intercourse with a man, nor I with you. For the Israelites shall remain many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterwards, the Israelites shall turn and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall come in awe to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. So again, it says again, you're going to go and you're going to basically cheat on me. And again, here's, a, here's this image of, but he, it, it's in the language of like bride price. Right? Like he's paying for her. But this idea, like he's he's buying her back to himself. So she goes after other lovers. And is he making a payment to those lovers to like buy her back? But again, it for a modern view of, of marriage relationships and, and fidelity, it's, it's like, Thank you.